right, my name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here with Seth Morgan Long, uh, Morgan Long Wines. We're at Lingua Franca. Uh, it's December 16th, 2019. Seth, thanks so much for joining us today. We appreciate Grateful this. to be here, thanks. Uh, we'll start as we always do with the most important question, which is why wine? Uh, that's a great question. I started in the wine industry just over a decade ago. I came to wine through restaurants, through food. <clears throat> My first job when I was 15 was as a prep cook at a restaurant down in Eugene. And I ended up working in kitchens through college. And then after college, I was offered a gig uh, doing Harvest at Argyle, which I turned down to move to the front of house hmm? of this restaurant management company that I worked for. And over the five years that I was in management for this company, uh, I, I gained this mastery of diversified specialties, hmm? none of which was uh, like, you know, 10 years in the restaurants and I was like, what, what am I, what am I really a master of nothing? And so, um, I was interested in wine just because of food and, um, didn't really grow up in a family that valued wine mm -hmm. in a, in a really explicit way, but, um, there was definitely wine on the dinner table, you know, growing up. And so I did the International Sommelier Guild uh, certification starting in 2008. And that's how I met Erica Landon. Um, and uh, moved to Portland 10 years ago in the midst of this diploma certification process. <clears throat> and um, couldn't find a job in a restaurant, uh, waiting tables, busting tables, washing dishes. It was 2009 and nothing was happening, you know, even with 15 years, mm -hmm. 10, 15 years of restaurant experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, Erica was prescient or she was, I don't know, she just, she encouraged me to look at Harvest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I got a gig working for Patrick Taylor at Cana's Feast in 2009 and uh, like showed up to, you know, first week of first harvest wearing like, you know, loafers <laughs> at like, at, you know, not, not really understanding much about winery work, but having, you know, spent, uh, over a year of uh, like really um, regular study in the in the world of wine and the culture of wine through this sommelier work, and um, so I learned a lot at Harvest, and it was like the most important thing that I learned was that I wasn't really interested in restaurants, mm -hmm. and so I you know bought a bunch of. I mean, I bought like Carhartt clothes. I like committed, right? <laughs> like I changed my wardrobe. I changed the, the focus of, you know, coming into wine from years in restaurants, kind of like doing all of these things, thinking like wine, you know, like, and then in that portal, it was like production, you know, like winemaking. And so, um, yeah, did a 2010 Harvest under Thibaut Monday at Willakinsia State and Sarah Cabot um, was the assistant winemaker there. Um, pruned that winter with um, Mikey Etzel, who was the, one of the viticulturalists at Willakinsia at the time. And um, Sarah Cabot got me connected to um, a winery in the central Otago region, um, kind of in the midst of the next harvest at Willakinsia State. 
So um, it was, uh, yeah, so nine at Canis Feast, 10 at Willikins Estate, and then pruning straight to Central Otago in early 2011, which led to Reese in the Santa Cruz Mountains in uh, August of 2011, where I worked under Jeff Brinkman. Um, and th that, that harvest in the Santa Cruz Mountains at Reese was when things really began to, like, the gears started clicking into place. Mm -hmm. Um, in a lot of ways, like just the, I was no longer wearing loafers to do punch downs, right? It was like, you know, I committed and, and really um, taken on, um, I'd like moved away from kind of like the sommelier mindset mm -hmm. to more of like a cellar rat, you know, mm -hmm. and um, the, yeah, there was a there was a really important morning conversation with Jeff Brinkman at Reese, where I basically looked over at him. It was five a.m. and we were like just getting the sorting table going, and uh, I said, you know, I'm going to take over your job one day, and he he said, yeah, that's great. You should go to Burgundy first, and I said, yeah, can you make that happen? And he said, yeah. Do you want to go to Dujac or Demonte? <laughs> Which you know for. Um, for someone in my position who, you know, spent years kind of learning wine from a sommelier mm -hmm. uh, viewpoint, there, you know, there was a lot of material there for me to sing my teeth into. Um, and because I'd kind of come up the first few harvests in the Willamette Valley where the, you know, the overwhelming focus is on Pinot Noir, I said Dujac because, you know, like Dujac is one of the best domains in Burgundy throughout throughout the Cote de Nuit, Cote, Cote d'Or, and um, they were full. So I was I was invited to work at De Monti, which you know I was very fortuitous considering what I'm doing now. Um, <laughs> So De Monti has a, has a great Pinot program, but also a very um, um, a beautiful white wine mm -hmm. program. Mm -hmm. And um, so it was during the harvest, during my, my second harvest of 2011, when that doorway to Burgundy opened. And um, in hindsight, I mean, like, like the Oregon wine industry was was really important for me to kind of like lose the loafers, so to speak, and gain like this kind of um, great interest um, in in winemaking, and kind of gave me some really foundational pieces. Um, to just like the the work ethic, the requirements of of mindset and perspective, and um, so that as a foundation, and then getting this invitation to Burgundy, which is you know with someone with a with a very basic background in in wine can like there's levity to that. Mm -hmm. And so um, I went back to uh, Willikens Estate for the 2011 harvest, which started very late. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I went, came back knowing that I was going to Burgundy the next fall. So um, yeah, returning to Oregon after doing a harvest in California, um, like my, the way that I looked at the Willamette Valley wine industry, the Oregon wine industry, shifted in a major way then. Just, you know, is 
the, I don't know, like the boundaries that, that sometimes exist in Oregon against Californians is like, mm -hmm. like it's palpable, right? There's, there's, um, and I, like, my experience doing Harvest, that, that boundary dissolved and, and, um, it was really useful for me to have kind of just gained not only kind of like a respect for the, the neighbor to the south, but also gained through the harvest there this doorway to this other world that, you know, now that the, the experience of, of Burgundy has changed again what like my experience of the Willamette Valley in a major way. Um, so, uh, yeah, did, did a, the third harvest that year um, at, at Willa Kinsey Estate. Um, so, you know, it was between 2009 and 2011. I'd done like five harvests and was starting to get sharper mm -hmm. with winemaking and um, but still like got yeah got got to Burgundy and and was um, in 2012 and definitely the the least experienced intern on that team. Mm -hmm. Actually, I was the second least uh, experienced intern, and here I was, like, I thought I'd kind of gotten somewhere, and and um, so anyway, that that first harvest at uh, at De Monti in 2012, I was I was tasked with the red wines, mm -hmm. and um, but over the course of that year, over that harvest. Like when it was my turn to pick wines for lunch or dinner, like I was grabbing bottles of white burgundy. And at lunch and at dinner, like very, very, very rare bottles of white burgundy were being opened blind and we were, you know. Mm -hmm. I, you just, my understanding of what Chardonnay is shifted in a major way. Um, My mindset, I think, was coming from kind of like a classically trained um, understanding of, of, of like Pinot Noir and Chardonnay and Cabernet and Bordeaux and Rhone and Mosul. Like, I, I was interested at the time in more esoteric wines because they were new and different and exciting and so um, yeah I mean truth be said when I got to Burgundy it was like Chardonnay was like too pedestrian mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was still obviously like mindset is I mean it's Oregon Pinot Noir mm -hmm. right like that's what everybody talks about Oregon Pinot Noir and um, then I was tasting these, these white burgundies and just being really impressed. Um, so before I left De Monti that first year, I set up a, a return for 2013 and um, it was pretty clear that I wanted to to focus on the white wine program and and so that's what happened I went back the next year and focused on the white wine program and I mean I don't think I did a punch down that that harvest um, and uh, that was really I mean like I'm so lucky I'm really lucky that I got that opportunity um, and so came back to the Willamette Valley, did over five years, did seven harvests, seven harvests in five years on three continents. And then I returned back to the Willamette Valley in, at the end of 2013 with 
like one singular focus, which was Chardonnay. And the goal being using what I learned around the world and not really competing in the Oregon wine industry with Oregon Pinot Noir and just with a singular focus on Willamette Valley Chardonnay. So uh, 2014 was the year that I started my brand. Uh, worked with one vineyard and, and bought one and a quarter tons, made three and a half barrels. Um, traded a little bit of my uh, labor for credit at a winery and um, yeah, just kind of fumbled my way through um, and made made some decent wine. Mm -hmm. And I um, was lucky to sell it in six months and then just did it all again. So um, that's kind of how I got into wine. <laughs> is uh, it was um, a choice, you know, like coming from work with such a wide focus and wanting to master something, mm -hmm. you know, or just like have this, have a clear purpose and, and then, you know, entering the, the Willamette Valley wine industry and seeing, um, you know, how a couple different folks do it and then going to New Zealand and, and then going to California and just again, like, there was this process of, you know, getting into the wine industry, but then again, like seeing a broad perspective and then seeing, I mean, just seeing the possibility of, I don't know, just creating this, this little niche of just focusing on, on Willamette Valley Chardonnay. So. I just want to back up for a second to uh, your, your sommelier studies. Uh, tell me about learning wine from that perspective and then getting in and actually making it. What, what were there perceptions you had about the winemaking process that were kind of shattered when you started doing it, other, other than your f footwear, of course? I mean, the, yeah, there's just, I mean, the only reason I remember that is because someone took a photo of me <laughs> and it's just like, I'm doing a punch down and it's like, but these loafers anyway. Um, yeah, I, I, that that is a uh, that's a great question, and and so the way in which sommelier studies work, um, regardless of what whether it's ISG or or quartermasters or you know it's there's a romanticism, you know that that is important for practitioners of service um, to be able to, I mean, you're on stage mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as a server, as a sommelier, like you're on stage and you're supposed to be able to um, kind of freestyle, you know, you're, you're engaging with guests and you're engaging with a, uh, with a chef and so, yeah, the romanticism was strong for me, you know, and um, I think that that showed in my desire to, you know, kind of go along with Oregon Pinot and be like, you know, that's why I wanted to work at Dujac. It's why I went to Central Otago to learn the, like how Pinot Noir was produced outside of the Willamette Valley because I, I knew that, they, you know, there was Burgundy and, and like, so yeah, the, the romanticism, but also, yeah, I mean, I think that there's a, there's a level of reverence that I gained for um, winemakers and sommeliers and farmers that, um, you know, like you see it these days with, with um, Psalm. Mm -hmm. I mean, like mm -hmm. sommeliers are rock stars mm -hmm. now. Um, whereas like if you look at it in the old world, I mean, that's, it's, it's, you know, um, very, again, like I'm super lucky that I got into wine from, from service. I think it's a, 
You know, I think there's a lot of folks that in winemaking that are, are they, they don't come, well that's actually, now it's, I think there's a lot more people entering the wine industry not with a background in chemistry, biology, farming, you know, but I think, I don't know, five years ago, 10 years ago, I don't think that that was really the case. And I think one of the reasons that I, that I ended up starting my own brand was because I, I learned even with, you know, seven vintages in, in five years, like since I didn't have a degree in enology and viticulture, I wasn't really considered for winemaking, assistant winemaker positions, seller master positions. Um, so there was, a, I would say that the um, learned romanticism. I learned um, the importance of being on stage and, and presenting yourself. I learned uh, reverence. But I think I also learned entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. ship, mm -hmm. you know, just kind of, I mean, I didn't go to school for enology and viticulture. I barely paid attention in math class and biology and chem, I mean, like, I'm, I, I studied environmental studies and geography at U of O, which there is a huge connection to wine, you know, like, but, um, yeah, the, the sommelier, entry point to winemaking was, I think, pretty unique, mm -hmm. um, at least for like the, the people that I was working with in, at Willikins Estate and uh, in, at Akarua and Bannockburn, Central Otago, and at Reese, mm -hmm. and at, you know, at, at De Monti, like, um, so, I mean, if I could go back and do it over again, I wouldn't do it any different. The, that, it was a it was a great entry point and um, yeah I, I mean when I see Erica um, I often just like thank her for encouraging me to think about production mm -hmm. as opposed to kind of continuing in in that in the restaurant realm. Mm -hmm. um, that was it. It was a, a, a interesting place to enter uh, an industry that is a lot more about science than, um, than I think I really, I got in that, in that, in the sommelier study, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, fast forward and you know, five years into this, this business, I mean, I think you, you, you use the word like, did, did you, uh, what's a pri what did you say? Yeah, perceptions about winemaking that were yeah. kind of changed by actually doing it. Right, right, and you know, now flash forward and like, the romanticism is, is gone. You know, like there's nothing romantic about this other than like, again, what I put on when I'm like, holding tastings or I'm out pouring my wine in different markets but um, I mean it's the uh, the level of of work is it's serious mm -hmm. um, and it's very challenging but it's I, I mean I I love it I love every minute of it it's again if I could go back and do it over again I, I wouldn't change a thing Pretty lucky, pretty nice. Yeah, I mean, just like the, the way in which things have changed in Burgundy now, mm -hmm. like you need to be able to have a visa before you'll be even considered for a, an internship or stage mm -hmm. at, a, at a winery. I mean, it's, it's much harder now than it was in 2012 and 2013 when I was there. I mean, I. Um, I lucked out with that, the back-to-back -back vintage, 
vintages in Burgundy. And but I also lucked out, you know, working at Willa Kenzie Estate two years in a row and being, you know, recommended by Sarah to to work at this mm -hmm. this winery in Central Otago. And you know, I, I mean, just um, these little these little moments of fortuitousness, you know, like Erica recommending that I do harvest. It's, um, these little, these little bits of, of luck mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, I look back and it's just like, man, <laughs> yeah, you're just very lucky or... Mm -hmm. Good timing. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Perfect place, perfect time. Mm -hmm. So you, you worked, as you mentioned, a, a lot of harvests quickly on, on multiple continents, multiple states here. Yeah. Uh, kind of compare, contrast some of those experiences for me. What, what did you learn at various spots? What are some of the lessons you took with you, or either things you wanted to do or things you learned not to do uh, as you were kind of building your skill set? Yeah, I mean, um, that sometimes it's more important to learn how you don't want to do things. Mm -hmm. um, than, than how things should be done or, you know, and every, every winery has a different culture, has a different construction, right? Both like physically, but also mentally, you know, every winemaker has the, the, their, their little, their thing, their, you know, their approach, their philosophy. And um, I, I think that, I don't really differentiate between like what I, you know, I, um, like I don't think it's more important to learn to do things one way, or I, like there's value in learning how how to do things for certain people in in the place where they are, mm -hmm. and but it's also valuable to like kind of have your own. Um, the skill of like locating like is this important for me like if I were if this were me would this be important for for how I would do things and I mean I don't I don't think that one is more important than the other but I, it's just about um, I think the, yeah the the things that I learned um, traveling away from the Willamette Valley helped me make sense of of this place in just the same way that like me coming from this valley with you know this small industry where like in general there's a there's a pretty open and and supportive um energy you know like um it was also really interesting for me to go outward where like maybe that that isn't necessarily the case and so just um, uh, I mean specifically when I got to Reese in the Santa Cruz mountains um, you know it was my fifth harvest and so I was like starting to feel more confident and um, I gained some responsibility. I got like the lead. I was the fermentation management manager. You know, like um, my passion, my interest, and my confidence like pushed me to the front of that that small team. And and um, yeah, I mean that that harvest was. I mean, when I look back, that harvest. In, in the Santa Cruz Mountains at Reese was, I mean, I learned a tremendous amount about what I was capable of. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, getting that, that invitation to Burgundy mm -hmm. just really, I mean, it was very rare, just super rare to get, to get that. Mm -hmm. um, that opportunity, um, and I think that it it came from just like 
Yeah, working for working for Patrick, and then uh, you know, small a small winery in in Carlton, and then working at a pretty big winery in in Yamhill, and and then just kind of being like, yeah, I like this part, I don't like that part, but like, where do I? How do I want to? What's the pathway that I want to? Mm -hmm. That I want to walk in, and Reese was. I mean, there was only chemicals in that winery it was tartaric acid and sulfur for mm -hmm. I mean that was that mm -hmm. there was it was um, there wasn't you know there there wasn't like the net you know like the the farming and the winemaking needed to be precise mm -hmm. and I don't know just like the things clicked for me there but not because of Reese. I mean, it was it was because of you know kind of seeing how things were done here and here and, and just being just feeling like the foundations mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. had allowed me to elevate the craft, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I yeah Reese. I just I I really I started like running, you know. Um, and um, taste, did a lot of blind tasting and um, it's a great a, a, an amazing winery to work in and, um, but yeah the, the intentionality that, that they that they have in that winery was, was the, they were very purposeful about when they did things and and why they did it and um i th i'd like i thrived with that mindset mm -hmm. um and i mean if if i could go back i i didn't really get a chance to work in the white wines there um But I, again, like I like the focus on Pinot here in the, in Oregon in the Lama Valley, like also really useful for me to kind of like this, you know, Chardonnay was kind of just eh, and like, um, but the the separation that happened when I started paying attention to Chardonnay. And the opportunity that I saw coming back to Oregon after doing a couple of vintages in Burgundy was, I mean, I literally was, was like, how is nobody focused on Chardonnay here? For all of the, for all of the like Burgundian, you know, the tradition and like, well, like, if you go to Burgundy, I mean, it's like, it's, it's not, it's, it's more evenly allocated, red and white. Here in Oregon, I mean, it's like 70%, um, 60 to 70% of what's planted is Pinot Noir, and I mean, maybe five or 6% is Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, the, the, um, when I, when I like saw this, this vision of just just focusing on Chardonnay, I was just like I was thrilled. <laughs> I was thrilled with myself, but also really thrilled with the the possibility, you know, that that exists um, in the new world. Like I mean, if if I were French and I were from Burgundy, but I wasn't from a family, like. E you can't necessarily like start something mm -hmm. and what's really amazing in the new world and you know I think um, Oregon and California especially it's just like you know if you're if you're willing to 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 put the effort in I mean like there's so many people in in this valley that have been 
so helpful and so interested in my project and um, I mean it's it hasn't been a walk in the park but it's it's amazing to see the the possibility you know that that I could just buy a ton and a half and start with a few barrels and you know five years later I have like 42 barrels from six vineyards and um, yeah that the the size of the industry here it's I mean it's grown it's grown exponentially but it's still like it's there's there's a lot of um, it's small mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. I mean I think we make one percent mm -hmm. of of I don't know of the, the country's wine of the country's country, yeah. wine right but the but then the quality is is so high you know so um, which is a testament to the I mean just like the the climate and the hills and the the angle of the sun in the summertime, um, but also just, yeah, the the you know the camaraderie of the of the industry and uh, the interest that 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 clients have, you know, for you know the wine being produced here. Um, yeah, it's. I mean, I. I I really couldn't design it any better. <laughs> I mean, again, super grateful. Yeah. Tell me about, so you, 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 you have your second year in Burgundy, you've decided you have this focus on Chardonnay, you have this kind of aha moment, this, this is what I'm gonna do is gonna be Lima Valley Chardonnay. Tell me about the logistics of, of starting, of, of getting your brand off the ground, of finding your barrels, finding your grapes, uh, and, and what, you needed, what you felt you needed to do to be successful. It's easy. I mean, it was the um, acquiring barrels. I mean, I was given barrels uh, for free. I bought barrels. I was, you know, like, again, the, the industry in general is, you know, people are really, people in the Willamette Valley, in the, in the industry are, um, for the most part, like just really generous with their time, um, and I think that I think there is the the kind of mindset of like the rising tide lifts all ships, you know. And um, I mean, at a certain level, I think that there's some there's competition and there's and there's some like cutthroat business, um, but the logistics were. I mean, there was really it was very easy, mm -hmm. very easy to start. And again, like I have um, close friends that are from Burgundy that are making wine here. Um, and we talk about it often, you know, like if we, if we didn't live in the Lama Valley, if we didn't live in the new world, if we lived in, in the old world, the barriers, the logistics, the, the, the cost, of farming, um, the the you know the cost of argon nitrogen in in France is I mean people don't use it because it's too expensive. Mm -hmm. What I mean, it's it's really kind of like Goldilocks situation here, right? Like it's it's um, the industry's small enough, but the quality is is so high that um, I mean I think that the uh, Cooper, uh, you know, Cooper suppliers are very interested in, mm -hmm. in my opinion about how their Cooper, how the how the barrels mm -hmm. um, work with the fruit, and I think that there's, I think there's a lot of farmers that that maybe haven't. I mean, I think Chardonnay is probably in some ways harder to get than than Pinot, but. It's also like when, when I tell people my focus, I, I mean like, I think there's farmers that are interested in, in that, you know, I mean, 
Um, so, yeah, the 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 barriers to entry are low. Mm -hmm. They were low, and I think they still are. I mean, it's like. I don't know how many hundreds of brands have started in the last five years, but there's a lot, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, and the stories, uh, you know, the, the, the folks that are coming in and planting vineyards or starting brands, I mean, I, I mean, I see a lot of like, um, I see myself, you know, like just really interested, mm -hmm. driven folks who, you know, maybe maybe it's the romanticism that's still like alive and 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 like um, yeah the me starting f with one vineyard and three and a half barrels in 2014 to three vineyards and seven and a half barrels in 2016 to six vineyards and 30 37 barrels in 2017. I mean. The, it's really easy. It's really easy to buy fruit. It's really easy to buy barrels. It's really easy to get used white barrels with enough foresight. I mean, it's, um, the hard part is selling the wine. The easy part is, is buying the fruit. Um, and, and, you know, again, like, talking with other winemakers and, and talking with sommeliers and um, I mean, that stuff's easy. Mm -hmm. it's, the, it's the sales that's the, that's the more challenging part, mm -hmm. especially the, the, you know, like how do you value your work, your mm -hmm. time and mm -hmm. what do you, what do you, what value are you adding, you know, to the work that's done for months and months in the vineyards and um, I mean that that part is more challenging to me mm -hmm. than the, the logistics of you know the supplies man that's the stuff that just people want to sell you barrels <laughs> you know and they want to sell you racks and tanks and um, I, mean, I mean it took me a number of years to where, I guess it took me two, two vintages before people started offering me fruit. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for example, in 2019, I got access to fruit that I have been asking for for five years. So it's not always like easy to get the fruit from that one vineyard, mm -hmm. right? But, um, yeah, just a couple vintages in, I mean, people were offering me fruit. Mm -hmm. So so what were you looking for uh, vineyard-wise? Did you have an idea what kind of grapes you wanted? I mean, what, not what kind of grapes, but like sure. what kind of site you were looking for? It's easy, man. If it's Willamette Valley and it's Chardonnay, I'm interested. <laughs> um, it does make it easy. Yeah. <laughs> the, um, yeah, working in, in Burgundy, there was a lot of talk about clones. Um, and you know, we, we, we spent a little time out in the, in the vineyards, but really I was, I was like in the winery. Um, but I bring that up because, you know, I think that in the Willamette Valley in Oregon, the, uh, there is a lot of focus on clones. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, you'll have people on either side of like, Dijon or not Dijon mm -hmm. and um, and there's a lot of people that have opinions one way or the other I like for me it's it's um, I'm interested in anything that's Willamette Valley and Chardonnay I'm interested in marine sediment soils I'm interested in volcanic soils I'm interested in Dijon I'm interested in Wente Draper I'm interested in blocks of one mm -hmm. I'm interested in selection of all in, in a field blend I'd like um, again you know like because I've reduced the focus so far mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know it's like 
I could definitely be only interested in, in one soil and, and one, you know, one realm of plant material, but it's, um, I am interested in, in what Willamette Valley Chardonnay is, mm -hmm. and so whatever it is, I'm interested in it. And I um, started out with, with old vines in uh, marine sediment soils, and, and I've been lucky to, to work with old vines and volcanic soils and 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 I've also been lucky to work with very young vines mm -hmm. and um, I I don't know the again like the the romanticism of making wine has has kind of killed the like you know old vines and heritage clones and like this you know it's website fodder but I've also like I've seen young vines from Dijon clones make superlative wine, mm -hmm. you know? And so, um, definitely entered this business focused on like old vines, you know, heritage clones. Like I was definitely like, I'm not interested in Dijon clone, mm -hmm. you know? And what five years of, of making Willamette Valley Chardonnay has taught me is that that, you know, that limiting is, it's really only limiting me and, and what I'm able to, to learn. And so, yeah, I, I don't, I don't, um, I don't value, you know, Dijon more or less than Draper or Wente. And I, I, I do, I am kind of finding myself drawn to volcanic soils more than marine, mm -hmm. but you know, it's really interesting to see how the climate is shifting and, and, um, and how water is, you know, more or less available. And yeah, it's just, I'm, so long and short of it is I'm, I'm interested in Willamette Valley Chardonnay, period. <laughs> so whatever, whatever AVA, whatever vine age, whatever plant material, whatever rootstock, I'm, I'm um, yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm interested in, in all of it and, and learning from it and, um, you know, hopefully over the next 20, 30, 40, I don't know, maybe I have, maybe I have 50 vintages left, I'm 38, so, plan on, yeah, I plan on, I plan on continuing to, this is my this is my life project. It's mm -hmm. like without a doubt. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. Definitely will be. I'm, I'm curious. We we do a lot of these interviews as we talked about before, and and, and obviously Pinot Noir is the dominant grape. And people yeah. talk. One of the things people talk about with Pinot Noir is how evocative it is of the place and of the terroir. So tell me about working with Chardonnay and how you are how your wines are evocative of of their place. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, no, it's, a, it's a great question. You know, the um, coming from that sommelier mindset, right? Like the, we we talk a lot about like terroir and the, um, you know, one thing that is left out of that conversation more often is um, humanity, like. Um, Vineyards wouldn't grow if they weren't controlled, mm -hmm. if trellising wasn't put into place, and end posts and catch wires. I mean, it, the human hand is, is, is not often spoken about. Um, and, right, so it's this um, elevating nature, right, over nurture, right, like this discussion of like evocative of place, but like a place that is curated mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. by many hands, by, you know, so, um, I mean, I, I, I value site character. I value vintage character tremendously. And, um, and, I, and I, I think that one of the amazing things about wine is that, is that kind of ability to 
be transported to a place, you know, like you have fino sherry with the right food. I mean, you can, it's, it's, a, it's a, a visceral feeling. I mean, um, so in terms of uh, what, what I do and, and what I value and um, in terms of like that, the terroir discussion, uh, site and vintage character, um, one of the things that I, I think Chardonnay does better than any grape mm -hmm. is show sight and vintage because it it doesn't have varietal character I mean it's it's um, it is a grape that um, doesn't put itself ahead in the same way that Sauvignon Blanc, mm -hmm. Riesling, Cabernet Franc, Sauvignon, Petit Verdot, Syrah, Pinot. I mean, um, yeah, what, what I think is really, really amazing about Chardonnay is that it's so malleable. Mm -hmm. um, you can grow it in a variety of ways in Burgundy and the expression can be very different. Mm -hmm. Champagne, I mean like sparkling wine. Um, and not, you know, not just champagne, but like cava, right? Like Chardonnay is grown in cava. It's not one of the main grapes, but um, it grows all over the U.S. I mean, with the difference between Napa and Sonoma is remarkable in terms of like the the way that Chardonnay is constructed. Um, and uh, yeah, so w I actually think that Chardonnay is is um, there's not a whole lot of varietal character. There's a whole there's a whole host of space in which the the grape in the in the course of a growing season is inflected in 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 ways by the amount of of days over 100 or 90 and the amount of water and the um the density of the planting and the slope and the aspect and the the water retention of the soil i mean that i actually think that chardonnay shows vintage and and sight better because there is less of a varietal character um, and maybe a, you know there's a lot of people that can argue one way or the other I mean it's like I, I I know there's a lot of winemakers here that um, in the Willamette Valley that that argue that you know um, Chardonnay does have varietal character and it's important to mm -hmm. um, reach levels of physiological and sugar ripeness to to get there and to show that varietal character and you know they're right but I'll tell you what in Burgundy I I mean the a lot of those wines a lot of the wines that I love from Burgundy that like they're not the wines that are like opulent and showy they're the wines with real energy and and texture and um, so I, the great thing about Chardonnay is um, it can grow in the Willamette Valley or really anywhere and it can be it can be allowed to reach levels of, mm -hmm. of physiological and, and sugar ripeness that is bolder and rounder and richer but it can also I believe that it, that you can find a, a space in between underripe and overripe that is mm -hmm. maybe the varietal character isn't isn't the most important aspect of what can be gained from enjoying the wine. I mean, you might um, you might feel the vintage and the 
and the soil of the site and the the farmer's decision a little uh, a little bit m more front and center. But I'm also really biased in you know in saying that uh, Chardonnay has um, an advantage over a lot of other grapes and in, in its malleability, but. Um, Yeah, I mean, the, the, I mean, the difference between a mallowed Chardonnay and a non-mallowed Chardonnay, the oak, like oak aging versus steel aging, I mean, it's like, there's so much, there's so much possibility with Chardonnay to express what, like, what you, what, what, what you find compelling, um, so. So on that, on that note, how would you describe your winemaking philosophy when it comes to making Chardonnay and to, and, and, and to showcasing what it is yeah. you find you find compelling? Yeah, I mean, I, I, as a you know graduate of the University of Oregon, like environmental studies and geography, um, was it, you know, um, I don't have a chemistry background, um, and that's been challenging. That's that's been I think. Learning chemistry has been as challenging as, you know, sales, right? <laughs> um, so the, the way that I imagine my wines, I, I, I think of them as like liquid almanacs. You know, they're like, um, the importance of the vintage character is as important as the the vineyard character to me, you know, like um, in the hierarchy, I, I don't know whether, I, I don't know what, what is most important, but um, yeah, you, you like expressing grape time and place mm -hmm. and having wines that are expressive of these, these really unique time periods and these really unique places um, with a culture, you know, that, you know, um, the language that you speak and the, and the way that you interact with your family, I mean, um, they translate into how you farm or how you make your wine. And just the ex Finding ways to express that is what I is what I'm up to. So, um, yeah, winemaking is is really simple for me. Um, I pick when I feel like the acidity, the sugar, and the physiological markers are all at their highest. So the apex and. Um, Typically what that is, is, um, you know, somewhere between 12 and a half, 12 and a quarter to 13% to potential alcohol. And um, yeah, as soon as, as soon as it's there and if the logistics of the pick and the, and the press, I mean, the fruit comes in and um, I don't necessarily process fruit the same way. Um, Obviously, like there are sites that I work with that have very high pedigree, and there are sites that you know maybe have slightly less pedigree. I and mean, Jason Lett has been kind enough to sell me 1968 Planted Draper from the original vines. Um, granted, I make one barrel of it, but that you know I treat Irie differently than say I treat like Seven Springs or Lubajac or Yamhill Vineyards, but I. I'm interested in, in um, kind of determining the, the pedigree of the, of the site and using the techniques and the tools that I have at my disposal to kind of um, both build up that, the character, but also kind of like strip away some of the, you know, it's, the, the analogy of um, a sculpturist mm -hmm. is, is 
I think is is important in winemaking where like you know sometimes you have to remove some of the the outer structure to reveal like the the core of the of the wine um, so you know the the way that I press and the way that I, I look at numbers, the way that I, I taste is, I'm, I'm not interested in just, um, just building up the thing that's there, but I'm also interested in kind of determining like what, what can I remove? Like what do I, it's, it's not, not always easy to know what what to do it's also like sometimes it's harder to know what not to do and mm -hmm. I so there's the winemaking part is it's it's easy and it's fun um, it's a there's so much there's so many details and all of these choices are um, they they end up changing the, the wine in in really subtle ways so I um, just I take a lot of notes and um, I taste a lot. I look at chemistry. I'm um, I'm a fan of utilizing technology. Um, you know I think that there's a, a ton to be gained by you know going to Davis and Fresno State and you know and gaining a degree in in viticultural analogy. And I also think that there's again I'm lucky that I came to this industry with a background in, in as a sommelier or you know with that you know the 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 knowledge to do that because um, it's allowed me a really unique kind of starting point mm -hmm. um, to look at kind of like the tools that we have access to I mean like the yeasts and the enzymes and the the filtration that's, you know, like, you can really shape the wine in any way you want. And the, the thesis of winemaking, it's, it's really fascinating what, what you can do by buying mm -hmm. um, yeasts and, and enzymes and chips. And, um, and I think that there's a level of, like, um, There's a level of, of um, winemaking that, that you, can, you can achieve by using thesis, you know? Um, stabilization and filtration. Um, and I also feel like there's, there's something really interesting happening in the world of wine right now, which is the, the antithesis, which is the, like the refusal. Um, or not the refusal, but the, the choice of like nothing, like nothing will touch this wine. And I, I, it goes back to this nature versus nurture and what do you value more, you know? And um, I'm not in either one of those. Like I, I, I'm in the middle. There's the, the, the tools. I, I love learning about the tools and the techniques and, and I also love like not needing to do anything because the vintage and the vineyard provided everything. But um, yeah, the romanticism of like not doing anything is it wore off pretty quickly making, making wine and, and needing to sell it. And so, yeah, I'm just kind of right in the middle of um, trying to use my intuition and my experience making wine in, in a lot of different wineries with different mindsets in terms of additions and um, I don't think that one is better than the other I just for me and either side kind of you lose a little bit of the soul if you're just you know it's if it's thesis and it's addition inoculation stabilization filtration bottle you know but um, I think that another, th the other side, like if you just refuse, I don't, you know, um, the marketability of, of the wines can sometimes be a little bit more challenging and, um, 
with a with a focus just on Chardonnay, um, you know, I, a lot of people tell me, oh, I I hate Chardonnay. <laughs> you know that when I'm like, yeah, I just make Chardonnay, they're like, oh, I hate it. <laughs> and um, you know, that's kind of a, a relic of maybe some of the things that that happened in the 80s and then in the 90s with with winemaking styles and. Um, but I, I love that. I love that um, what, I, what I am lucky to have is there's a, a I mean, Kendall Jackson makes 30,000 barrels of private reserve Chardonnay a year. I mean, Rombauer, I don't know how much they make, but um, uh, I mean, there's, there's so many brands that they make a lot of Chardonnay. There's a there's a there's a platform for me, mm -hmm. you know. That there's a there's a market, and um, it's that 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 was the aha moment, right? It was like I'm just gonna focus on on Chardonnay, and I like it's the second biggest white wine brand in the world behind Chardonnay or behind Champagne. Mm -hmm. So. Um, You know the the I think I'm getting away from your question, which is kind of that totally fine. Um, yeah, like winemaking for me, like the what makes the most sense is what what I was taught at De Monti. Um, so yeah, just um, reverence. Getting back to the idea of of you know being respectful of the of the work in the field in the farm in the in the vineyard for the year mm -hmm. leading up to harvest and not being um, like keeping myself honest by utilizing tools and technology but you know not getting so far away from like that the soul mm -hmm. of of like the hand work um, so the being you know reverent to to the the work of the farmer in my work is important to create a wine that is age worthy and and expressive of the vineyard and the vintage and um so yeah i a lot of what i work with is is french oak mm -hmm. um i love the the new new barrels these days i'm just buying 350 liter um, punchins and but I'm also buying some half barrels and so I work with a lot of oak varying varying percentages based upon the pedigree mm -hmm. and um, you know work with native yeast and um, minimal additions um, uh, not stirring and um, barrel aging for a year and then the wine is blended in steel for about a half year. Um, so that's, you know, that's, winemaking is pretty, pretty simple for me. Um, just staying in the middle of, of the, of the pull towards technology and tools and, but also the pull towards like, you know, the valuing nature over nurture, which I think, you know, there's, um, I think that there's a lot of there's a lot of energy in that in that realm like the natural wine mm -hmm. world is is uh, I think you know if I have a criticism of it it's you know you placing this placing nature on this pedestal and um, and forgetting it that like with the idea of terroir like vineyards don't exist like the vines are growing up in the trees, they're not, they're not going to be in a line. They're, you know, mm -hmm. There's a level of balance mm -hmm. that, um, that I think is, for me, is really valuable. You know? It's not knocking on anybody choosing to do that. Like, I love the, anybody doing whatever they want. You know? like I, I'm all for it, but personally, you know, just 
the idea of balance and the idea of uh, reverence is really important. Um, so, and I think that comes through in the wines that I that I produce. You know, I'm I'm interested in in. Um, I guess I would I I'm a little bit more of a classicist. You know, like Chardonnay. I mean, it's <laughs> it's it's. Um, People love to hate it, but it is, it's, it's, it's the second biggest white wine brand in the world. So let's talk about selling it. You've mentioned selling it a few times. You've mentioned, obviously, it's, it's big, but also a lot of people love to hate it. There's a perception of what Chardonnay is that is pr probably not what the Chardonnay you're making. So tell me, tell me how you approach selling it and how it has worked for you so yeah. far. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think, um, I'm definitely not reinventing the wheel. Like the way that I vinify and, and age Chardonnay is, it's it's definitely nothing new. You know, it's 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 um, if anything, you know, I'm I'm like I mentioned, I like really use the program that I learned at De Monti and but also you know talking with lots of winemakers and sommeliers and reading a ton and taking lots of notes and spending a lot of money on wine that, that I enjoy and just trying to like osmotically take in the, not just the vinification and the farming, but also like um, think about the, the marketing and the, the structure of the business. And um, so, yeah, um, I, don't, um, I don't have employees. I do all the work myself, like I, um, do all the sales myself, um, for the most part. I mean, I, I work with distributors, importers, but um, yeah, the, the reason that I, that I use like this size barrel and the reason that I bottle the wines and the quantities that I do um, in the tanks that, that I age them in is because I, I want to be able to actually lift, do the work myself. I mean, like 500 liter, or 600 liter punch in, I mean, that's like, I can't necessarily lift that myself. And so sales and, um, but like starting with, with winemaking, and I guess going back to farming, like I'm not a farmer. My parents were professors, you know? And um, so that's why I'm not a farmer, you know? <laughs> Cause I'm not a farmer. Um, and uh, so, with winemaking and with sales, it's really important for me to, to do the work myself. Like, I guess I'm the creative. Mm -hmm. um, but I also, um, yeah, it's important for me to sell. And so, um, sales is, it's the hardest part, but it's, it's actually, it's, it's not that hard. You know, it's just, it's really, it's like, get out of, get out of your, like get out of bed and get to your computer and ask for the appointments and then follow up a week after the appointment, you know, and constantly be, you just got to go out and do it. And, and um, yeah, the, 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 the years working in restaurants and, you know, both back of the house and front of house, like that being on stage and, and um, being of service. I mean, I, again, I am lucky that I came, came into the industry with this, you know, maybe not the firmest chemistry background. Mm -hmm. And um, with a background of kind of like, um, understanding what it takes to create a unique and meaningful dining experience for somebody. You know, like that, um, those years working in, in the front of the house of restaurants, um, it's, it's allowed me to understand when I can deliver, when to ask for appointments, mm -hmm. when to really turn up the, the heat on, in terms of like my energy, you know, and when to step away from sales and um, 
So, and, and for years, um, at the beginning of me doing sales, both for other brands that, you know, what, what I, I, I'm not just a winemaker for, I'm a broker. Mm -hmm. I sell imports and I sell other Oregon wines and I continue to do that. Mm -hmm. um, luckily, you know, um, but yeah, sales is, it's, it's, it's hard, but it's really not. It's just about um, getting out there and learning to love no. You know, it's like, um, it's learning to love rejection. Or not love rejection, but. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the, um, the ability for me to, to be out there with wine that I make that I believe in, that I'm excited about, mm -hmm. that I'm learning constantly mm -hmm. with, is um, it's really easy for me to get out and, and share what I do. Mm -hmm. um, and if anything, I take up too much time f of, of other people's, you know, like I am, I just, um, I'm really passionate and, uh, and I'm interested in, in these like deep philosophical truths uh, like or truth and meaning and purpose like I love the like I love that stuff I love um, diving deep um, so uh, yeah when I when I'm in New York um, or the UK um, which are two markets that I'm uh, I have very strong uh, sales in I mean it's it's easy like it's just it's fun because I'm I'm traveling and um, kind of being out there and, and being on the edge of like yeah, landing a 30 case deal with this restaurant and you know it's um, I mean there's a there's a game to it that's like this is I think I mentioned earlier you know like it like in general, the industry here is pretty community focused and there's, you know, there's lots of like AVA events and like, um, you know, I, I make wine in, in this facility where there's a number of different brands and we're all competing against each other for placements. But there is like, I mean, Thomas, um, who's the winemaker for Lingua Franca is the, you know, I consider him a really good friend, you know, and, and we, we share a lot you know, about like what's working, what's not working for, um, for us. But um, there's also a level of like, you know, getting the glass pour, you know, and, and landing that deal. Like, um, so again, it goes back to, you know, there's like, you can't be too friendly, you know, you can't be, but you also can't be like too, egotistical about like you know I, I, like I'm not changing the world with Chardonnay and I don't like I don't have any um, I'm not trying to reinvent mm -hmm. what Willamette Valley Chardonnay is or you know uh, you know I'm I'm um, so yeah there's just like sales is is this interesting dynamic of yeah sharing and being you know being open with your mailing list or your like your you know your contacts for this buyer for you know a friend and mm -hmm. but also like being really sharp and um, yeah if I, I mean if I don't sell I can't pay the I can't, can't pay the farmers and can't pay myself and mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, sales is really important. You know, sales is, is um, it's where you gain confidence to, to grow your brand, right? Like if you're, if, if the wine is landing for your clients or with your partners, I mean like, that's great. You're doing something right. Mm -hmm. And, um, and if it's not, you know, that's also great because you're, you, you know, go back to the drawing board. And I, I, I have days where like, 
everybody buys. And then I have days where like nobody buys. <laughs> and um, the days when everybody buys are definitely a lot more fun. <laughs> but um, I think you need both, you know? Like there, if this was, if winemaking and, and I mean, if it was easier, more people would be doing it, you know? And um, it's gonna be really, really interesting to see um, kind of with the, the explosion of the sales platform that is this. <laughs> I mean, how much the, the industry grows. And, um, but I think at a certain point, things become Uh, competition closes all businesses at, at, at a certain point, you know, um, which is, again, back to why I'm focused on Willamette Valley Chardonnay, because I literally do not want to be showing up to a wine shop in Portland with another Pinot. Like, I, I just wouldn't, I don't know. <laughs> I like the idea of um, having maybe a small piece of this Chardonnay mm -hmm. monopoly <laughs> um, along with you know some there's some really talented winemakers making world-class mm -hmm. Chardonnay in the Willamette Valley mm -hmm. so yeah sales I mean it's I'm I'm in sales like that's when I, when people ask me what I do it's I make Chardonnay and I'm in sales <laughs> sure yeah you mentioned the confidence from sales being being what helps you grow your brand. So tell me about as you look ahead for yourself. You're you're in your you're five years in. You've grown already. Tell me what you see as you look ten years down the road for your for yourself and your brand. Yeah, the um, the long term is um, I'm pretty clear about the long term goals for this this project um, and you know that the long term is is um, planting a couple small vineyards and um, building my own facility um, and stepping a little bit back from the the day-to-day -day mm -hmm. and having having a small team that helps um, or is invested in the in the in the business in some way um, and uh, so how to get there is um, you know over the next five plus ten plus years um, I just continue to, to understand what Willamette Valley Chardonnay is, which is why like, I, don't, I don't need it to be one plant material or another or one AVA or like it just, if it's in the Willamette Valley and it's Chardonnay, I'm probably interested. And um, because I, I, I wonder, you know, talking to some, some really, really um, well-respected winemakers, um, you know, they, they, one, one amazing thing that I've, that I've, I've heard from multiple people, like, if I say, like, what's the best wine you've ever made? I mean, the, the best answer that I've gotten from people that's really blown my mind is I haven't made it yet, you know? And, um, then there's the question of, are there are there pieces of land in the Willamette Valley that are actually maybe mm -hmm. the best pieces of property? That um, climate change is definitely going to push that um, to an extreme. Um, so yeah, I'm just really interested in, in um, yeah growing smart. You know, I think I'll uh, I pick up one one new vineyard in 2020, mm -hmm. and then 
an additional vineyard in 2021. Um, so that's like, yes, eight sites in the next two years. Uh, you know, probably be at 60 barrels at that point. So, um, but again, just, yeah, growing, like it's easy to buy fruit. It's really easy to say yes. It's really easy to buy barrels. And, um, but understanding the market and where you're at and where your distributors are at and where the president and his tariffs are at, you know, and um, like um, growing smart and intentionally is, is that's how I get to um, finding a couple unique pieces of property and planting and um, kind of starting to own a little bit more of the, the process um, farming, you know, which if, if farmers aren't doing what they're doing, I don't, I don't exist. So, um, but yeah, not coming from a, a farming family, you know, that's like, um, I don't know, definitely not rushing to buy land and plant. Um, and I have my hands full um, just with the vinification and the aging um, and then the, the sales. I mean, I really, I, doing it all of myself is, um, I, w I wouldn't do it any other way, but the idea of being responsible for, for farming is, I mean, that's just <laughs> long term. It's, it's definitely part of this, mm -hmm. this, this project. But in the meantime, yeah, it's just um, continuing to, to talk with farmers and other winemakers and, and um, learn mm -hmm. and, and refine the craft and um, yeah, old vines, young vines, Dundee, Eola, Shehalem, Willamette, you know, just like what is, what is Willamette Valley Chardonnay? Mm -hmm. That's, so, that's the question. That's the thesis. Yeah, and um, so, it's, uh, it's such a really, it's such a great feeling that I have this, you know, sitting in front of these like 42 barrels or whatever, like it's, um, I feel, I feel super gratified that, that um, there are so many people out there that are interested in, in wine and, and um, I mean I feel gratified that, that your project is, is helping share that but you know it's, um, the, I love the work and um, definitely um, I I feel really grateful that I, I get to wake up and, and um, you know, Monday morning is not something that I dread. And uh, I live in Portland, so getting here, I mean, it's, it's an investment, you know. And, um, but I look forward to it. Like, summer is not something that I, like, I can't wait for summer to be over, honestly. <laughs> like, because I want, I, like. You want your fruit? <laughs> yeah, there's something I just every year, you know, like the um, yeah, something about the the what starts in August with me like really driving into these vineyards on a on a very regular basis and and starting to like catch back up, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, and then you know you know I bought some new barrels and I've got wines that need to be racked and there's just um, like summertime is this like I can't wait for this to be over and um, you know I wasn't born in Oregon I moved to my family moved to the Willamette Valley when I was nine so I mean I'm an Oregonian by default but um, I'm not a true you know I wasn't born and raised here um, but you know, like the, the winter time doesn't bother me, like the rain doesn't bother me, 
I, I like. I think one of the reasons why we make amazing wine here is because we have adequate winter rainfall. Um, so I, I bring that up because like I don't need the summertime. Like I don't need the sun. It's like the the rain doesn't bother me. The gray doesn't bother me. The the um, and neither does the sun, but like summertime is it's like, I just, I know that harvest is like, mm -hmm. it's right around the corner and I can't wait for it. Um, and uh, I mean, winter is, is wonderful too. Um, yeah, all these barrels are done fermenting and the, the quality of uh, 2019, I, 2019 is without a doubt the, the best vintage that I've made wine in the Willamette Valley. Nice. I'm really excited about the, the the quality and the character of the wines. is It's, it's special. Um, but yeah, not every year is like that, and and I don't need it to be. Like I I am. I don't need it to be easy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. I'm I'm excited when when. I mean, I'm not excited when things don't go according to my plan. Um, but that's, you know, I'm working with, I'm working with vinegar here. Like that's, like I'm, I'm working with something that wants to become something that I am keeping it away from. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it's, it's, uh, the, the dynamics of, of, of this work is, it's like never a dull day, mm -hmm. even when things are going great, you know? <laughs> Um, so yeah, this, this industry uh, is, it's definitely um, not for the, I think if you're getting into this industry, the, the, the level of what it's going to take from you far, it, it outpaces what it gives to you. Mm -hmm. Um, at least that's been my experience. It's like, it's taken me a lot and it still continues. It, it takes a lot for me to like, yeah, going back to that idea of like reverence, mm -hmm. like keeping humility, um, but allowing like for, to, you know, allowing yourself to, you know, to congratulate yourself and to compliment other people, you know, on, and to be happy for other people's success and, and, um, yeah, to be grateful for when fermentations don't go right, you know, and to, um, just remember that, like, you're just a, like, you're just a speck on a planet spinning that's, I mean, this universe is very big and, <laughs> and wine is this, this um, it's interesting that wine is this like luxury product now, mm -hmm. you know, and again, going back to like, I mean, it's great that, that, um, that sommeliers are now like rock stars and, and winemakers are rock stars and, um, but you know, Back in back in in the old world in in France, I mean, like, it's it's not it's not that, you know, and um, it's uh, it's just part of the culture, mm -hmm. and so um, yeah, I love it. Wine is, I mean, if I didn't have wine, I don't know what I would be doing. Be amazed how often we hear that. <laughs> What's that? You'd be amazed how often we hear that. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's like I it's, mean. It's the, the thing. Yeah, and like I, every year I'm confronted with a like, all right, releasing new wines and like, I mean, is like, is the bottom going to fall out? Like, am I going to, is our sales going to happen? Like, what if I can't sell? And like, what am I going to do? And, you know, it's, it's mm -hmm. um, but. Yeah, then you make a couple sales and you're feeling good and you make more sales and 
Um, yeah, it's 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 really amazing. It's really amazing what you know the 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 internet has allowed for people to yeah maybe step away from work that isn't super gratifying, you know, and to find something that they can they can own. Mm -hmm. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's really great to see how many how many folks are just starting out right now or started out you know, a couple years ago or five years ago and um, are, are able to make it through this, through this, this world, you know, really starting with nothing. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it's, it's really amazing to just to talk to other winemakers, but, and, but also talk to, to people that are, that are, you know, just interested in wine and it's, um, it's great to be able to to do. Uh, again, I'm just so I'm so grateful to be able to do this work. I'm lucky. <laughs> lucky I have zero bosses, um, and uh, get to travel and yeah. I don't know what. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I don't think that I would do do well. In a um, in an environment where it was like nine to five and working for somebody else, it's um, and wine helped me see that because it, I was definitely on the path of like, yeah, I'm just gonna get I'm gonna I'm gonna get a cellar master position and then an assistant winemaker position and you know and like what I told Jeff Brinkman at Reese, like I'm gonna take over your job, but. Um, yeah, it didn't happen like that. <laughs> Definitely didn't really see that coming, but it just, it just, it just grew. Mm -hmm. So. What about as you look ahead for Oregon in general, what do you see the industry looking like in, in, in the next decade or so? What, what, what changes are coming? What, what do you expect? I mean, the changes, it's, it's already, it's already started. I mean, the, Um, yeah, so when I started 2009, you know, um, <sighs> Dominique Lafon was, was, had already been involved with Evening Land. Mm -hmm. Of course, Domaine Drun mm -hmm. has been here for 30 years. Um, but fast forward 10 years and it's like the Burgundians are here um, and they're coming quicker um, California like the, the brands and the and the the business architecture of the California wine industry has recognized mm -hmm. what's going on. And Washington is here. Figgins uh, and Betts. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be um, the next 10 years, it's going to be. Um, I mean, the Oregon wine industry is now, you know, just over 50 in the modern era. And so I think it's um, mid-aged, mid right? Like, um, it's a young, it's a young mid-age, but I think that, I think that what's going on is, is kind of like, a, who, who are we, you know? And there's, I think there's, it's very easy to be dismissive of these like corporate brands that are buying up, Calif you know, California corporate brands buying up, you know, Oregon. And, um, and I think it's also really easy to, rom to romanticize the Burgundians, you know, and, um, 
honestly, I think that the California, the, the interest from California business is more important. Um, like the, um, really at the end of the day, like what, what winemakers need to do is, is what farmers and winemakers and, and any, and also like the sales teams involved, like, um, they need to sell wine. And, um, so the, bringing a rock star consultant in from Burgundy, you know, like, great, you know, like you can craft a story, but it's, it's, um, so yeah, I mean, I think that, um, it's going to be really interesting to see how the vineyards, res how the, how the, the, the new vineyard developments are, are undertaken and how old vineyards are updated. Um, and it's going to be fascinating to see um, kind of like the how we define ourselves, you know, as a, as a valley, and and um, it's going to be really interesting to see if if um, if we can continue to um, push quality and and of course, like the quantity is is about to mm -hmm. bubble. I mean. La Crema, Willamette Valley Chardonnay, right? And like, um, I mean, I don't, uh, the Francis Ford Coppola's brand, I mean, it's, it's, um, so I think that it's, it's, uh, the climate changing is a real thing, but the, the landscape and the personalities are changing too. Mm -hmm. And, um, there's definitely going to be some um, some vineyard contracts that are going to be harder and harder for smaller producers to to hold on to. But I think that there's too much there's too much emphasis placed on farmers markets and farm to table and local. You know, like I'm not that concerned by the California brands coming here, and I'm also like not that like I don't know like I don't. I love it that like um, so many Burgundians are coming here and it's, but um, um, yeah, I think it's, it's a testament to of what, you know, David Lett and Charles Corey and, and all of the founding, you know, the, the founding families, like the, the risks that they took, like the, the climate is just, it's very good here mm -hmm. for the, for the, for Pinot and Pinot Gris and Chardonnay and Riesling and and you know there's some there's some winemakers. I mean, you mentioned Chad Stock. He's he's somebody that um, I respect very much. I made my first two vintages in the, in the facility that he managed. Um, so we've, we've made wine next to each other, and I mean, seeing what what he's doing of just kind of like I mean this in a in, like he. I mean this in, in all respect, like he's just like, forget Pino, like what else? Mm -hmm. At, like, I mean, that's fascinating. And, um, and there's room, there's room for, there's room for the California brands. There's room for the Washington brands. There's room for Oregon. There's room for like exploration of, you know, Trousseau and Cabernet Franc and Turrigan, like all of these, like, mm -hmm. Um, other cultivars that aren't planted here. And there's also a room for, I mean, Pinot and Chardonnay. And um, um, yeah, it's gonna be really interesting to see what happens over the next, even just next two years. I mean, with this like the 100% tariff proposed on, on uh, old world wines, French wines, I mean, that. Uh, I have some some of the distributors that I work with are. I mean, they won't survive that, mm -hmm. and so um, the Willamette Valley stands to gain a ton from that, you know, and especially with 
some of the the wineries that you know the wines really present less like Oregon and if you taste blind they, they present like Burgundy I mean like um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how, just how the next couple of years play out the next year but yeah it's great that there's so much interest you know and um, I, I yeah really really lucky that someone like David Lett and Charles Corey were like yeah man it's too warm here <laughs> like what what if we just like drove eight hours north but um, but as it would happen right like back then um, things were cooler like if you take the 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 Winkler index, which is like uh, something that UC Davis uses to classify heat summation. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're, we were, what we were 30 years ago, 40 years ago is not what we are now. So yeah, climate change and higher plantings and mm -hmm. um, other, other cultivars and um, yeah, it's fascinating. It's gonna be fascinating to see what happens. Yeah, I have, a, I have a buddy who just planted um, probably the property goes to 1,100 feet on Parrot Mountain. Wow. So um, it's going to be interesting to see what happens with that. Absolutely. I mean, if you think about, you know, a lot of the, the vineyards are like three, three to 600 mm -hmm. feet. Yeah. Um, but no one knows. It's going to be really interesting to find out. So that's all the questions that I have for you. Okay. Is there anything I didn't ask that I should have asked? Anything we didn't cover that we should have covered? <clears throat> no, I, don't, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> um, and now I'm on the spot. Yeah, I don't know. Spotlight in your face here. You're like, oh. No, no, I feel, um, yeah, I feel like I've expressed what, what, um, who I am and why I'm doing what I'm doing and, and who helped get me here and, um, yeah, the, the excitement for the future and, I mean, it's, yeah, no more, no more questions or no more thoughts right now. I mean, um, yeah, really grateful for this project. It's been cool to to watch these these interviews and see the portraits and and um, grateful to be a part of it. Well, thank you, thank you so much for being a part of it. Yeah. Thanks for your time, for your stories today, and your philosophical thoughts. And we'll go ahead and let you off the hook.